You had forgotten to do something else, something important, and how to believe the house you wake in is your home. This prompted Mrs. Nelson to draw a chalkboard diagram detailing how to chant the psalms during cigarette breaks and how not to squirm for sound when your own thoughts are all you hear. Also, that you have enough. The English lesson was that I am is a complete sentence. And just before the afternoon bell, she made the math equation look easy, the one that proves that hundreds of questions and feeling cold and all those nights spent looking for whatever it was you lost and one person add up to something. I am, it's a complete sentence. I love that. Things that we didn't actually miss in fourth grade, but that are there for us to discover. And this is, this is a signed Bible lesson for the morning, uh, extended by one, by, no, by three verses. I hope nobody adds, minds extra verses on the end of the part that was assigned. Uh, this is about Paul in the Greek city of Athens, um, standing up in the Areopagus, a gathering place where people like to discuss ideas. So Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. Uh, I should say all the, the commentaries are a little divided on whether he's following the, the, the Greek uh, oratorical uh, process of uh, flattering the audience to get them with you or if he's being, uh, being sarcastic because ex extremely religious can also be translated as how s uh, very superstitious you are. So nobody's quite sure. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's standing up and trying to build bridges. Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the, the inscription on it to an unknown God. Now what you're worshiping without knowing, I intend to make known to you. For the God who made the world and all that is in it, the sovereign of heaven and earth, doesn't live in sanctuaries made by human hands and isn't served by human hands as if in need of anything. No, God is the one who gives everyone life and breath and everything. From one ancestor, God created all of humankind and made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live. God did this so that human beings would seek and reach out for and maybe even find the one who is not really far from any of us, the one in whom we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have put it, we too are God's children. If we are in fact children of God, then it's inexcusable for us to think that the divine nature is like an image of gold, silver, or stone, an image formed by the art and thought of mortals. God overlooked such, such ignorance in the past, but now commands all people everywhere to reform their lives. For a day has been set when the whole world will be judged with justice. And the judge is a human being, God has already appointed. God has given proof of all of this by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection from the dead, uh, some of them sneered, while others said, oh, we must hear you on this topic some other time. At that, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite and a woman named Damaris and others with them. That's the, that's the Bible reading for the day. What's up, Philadelphia? Oh, look at that. All right. I've always, I've always wanted to do that, like a, a rock star, ginning up the home crowd. Right? Um, so maybe it's, it's a little bit trickier in, uh, in hybrid, for, uh, hybrid format. What's up, Pisgah Forest? Well, I guess my dad's just laughing at me now. I, mean, <laughs> I was, I was going to say, Holland, Michigan, <laughs> represent. <laughs> there we go. Fenville, no, Fenville's not here. I think Fenville's doing Mother's Day stuff. And I, for, I forget the right cities for everyone else. So we're going to, I'd be terrible at this game. Um, uh, uh, so what's that? 
Newcastle, Pennsylvania. <laughs> uh, all right. <laughs> it looks very, very underwhelming. All right, do we have, um, all right, so yeah, it's just, it's not just rock musicians. It's, it's all traveling entertainers, right? The good trick for building a quick rapport with the audience. Call out the name of the place in a way that suggests you're as excited to be there as they are for you to be there. And every once in a while, it backfires. Maybe, maybe, the, maybe the performer forgot where they were in their tour, so they called out the wrong city. I've, I've heard of those. I was, um, I was at a, a show once where the singer was a little bit too nonchalant and deadpan about it, so he just said, hey, how's it going, Philly? And everybody just looked at him. And he said, aren't you supposed to go nuts when I say that? I'm from Detroit. They just go nuts. Um, I think he was just tweaking us. But... Um, I don't know what the convention was in first century Greece. Do you, uh, do you think that Paul strolled into the Areopagus and said, what's up, Athens? I, I don't know. Um, let's get a little bit of context. The, um, the morning's Bible reading is the second half of a chapter in Acts that is action-packed. It sees Paul in full touring mode, and it, it actually he... He's in three different cities in this, in just this one chapter, as he's traveling around trying to help the Jesus movement grow. Um, so his pattern each time is to start by finding the synagogue, which at this point in history isn't necessarily a building. It just means a, a gathering place where Jewish people and some interested non-Jewish people would gather to worship. And you go in and discuss and worship and debate and take take part in that kind of conversation and debate that was characteristic of first century Judaism. In the first two cities, though, he wound up on the run. Maybe I should say from the first two cities. He wound up on the run from the first two cities. Um, he was threatened by people who felt that their own sense of the social order and the religious order were, uh, were being threatened by what he was doing. So each time they ran him out of town, which is how he ended up in Athens in the second half of the chapter. Uh, uh, cranky, as it happens. Bef before the part where we picked up the story, it says that he was distressed to see the, uh, the city full of idols. And he spent every day arguing in the synagogue and the marketplace. That's what it, what it says, arguing every day with, the, with, the, with fellow Jews, with non-Jews who were drawn to Judaism, with, uh, with Epicurean and Stoic philosophers. Um, cranky, 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 just arguing. And maybe not all of that effective. Because the story says that some of the people were, called him a babbler. What is this babbler running off at the mouth about? Um, it just doesn't sound very flattering, I think. Uh, some of them said that all his resurrection talk, talk meant that he was uh, teaching about some kind of foreign deities. The, the Greek word for resurrection is anastasis. So uh, apparently they thought he was talking about a goddess named Anastasia, is, is what I think. It sounds like a Disney movie, doesn't it? Uh, um, anyhow, Athens was always down for some new entertainment. So somebody invited Paul to the Areopagus where they did all of this debating and philosophizing and talking and learning. Um, and they said, come, come make a presentation. We'll, we'll hear you on this. And that's when he walked out in front of the crowd and said, make some noise, Athens! Or not. The, um, the, the version that I read this morning is mostly the New Revised Standard version of the Bible with some editorial glosses because the NRSV insists on only male uh, pronouns for God. Uh, but in this version, Paul just started by saying, Athenians. And here's where I'm mostly going to ignore the rest of what Paul said in favor of noticing what he did not say, which was, Athenians. First, let me say a word about those editorial glosses. We've got a, a banner that we sometimes put out on the front lawn. It'll probably go up again next week. The banner that says, we take the Bible seriously, but not literally. Um, there, there are Christians who would be horrified by the idea that we make little editorial glosses and verbal changes to the text while we read it. Um, but 
that horror is, uh, comes from a selective understanding. In, in some ways, the, the Christian New Testament is its own editorial gloss on the Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, all of that talk that Paul did about a Messiah who had to suffer and rise from the dead, that's a, that's a Christian interpretation of the Hebrew Scriptures that, that most Jews didn't read as being in, in their Bible. That's not how, what they understood the Scriptures to be saying about a Messiah. The Scriptures are rooted in their particular times and particular places. Anytime a reader hopes to glean a bit of wisdom from them, they have to go through an act of interpretation to become sensible to us. Anyone who reads a Bible in English has to take this as a starting point. A lot of English Bibles, especially, but not only, those that are favored by moderate to liberal Christian readers, um, a lot of English Bibles have tried to be expansive about recognizing that women actually existed in the ancient world. Weird, right? <laughs> um, but, but that uh, they, they have tended to opt for inclusive language uh, in circumstances where it was likely that a mixed group of people was present and being spoken to, even if the, the language in the, in the original was, was, uh, was exclusive. So, for instance, Paul's shout-outs to the Athenians, in, to the crowd, in the New Revised Standard Version, simply says, Athenians, the inclusive Bible, which um, bills itself as the first egalitarian translation, um, it has Paul start out by uh, starting the speech with, citizens of Athens. In the, the open English Bible, if any of you has a copy of a new New Testament, Hal Talsig edited, um, the, the, the version of the, the canonical text in that is the Open English Bible. And that starts out by having Paul call out to people of Athens. It's also, that's also what the New International Version opts for, people of Athens. And all of that makes sense because the Jesus movement was not just for men. So just like a lot of people have moved away from the antiquated term mankind when they're trying to talk about all of humanity, um, the, a lot of English language Bibles have, have also done their work of recognizing that humanity comes in more than one anatomical arrangement and gender identity. In general, that's praiseworthy. But sometimes we should also remind ourselves that our tiny steps forward can hide a more complicated past. Like the fact that Paul would have had easy access to a term that was gender neutral when he greeted the people of Athens at the Areopagus, a term like Athenians or citizens of Athens or people of Athens, you, you know, any kind of shout out that might have acknowledged that uh, the gathering was not just men, What it's, it's true, I'll say, it's true that most of the people at the Areopagus, according to the scholarship on it, most of them were men, it was mostly men who came to hear and debate and philosophize, but there were women who showed up there sometimes, some women who traveled from out of town and came for a new experience, or uh, sometimes courtesans or sometimes Stoic philosophers. The Stoic philosophical order included women, so they might show up to learn and discuss and debate. So there were women there. There probably would not have been many women, but there would have been some women. And yet what Paul decided to start with was, at least according to the Greek language of the story, is men of Athens. Men of Athens, make some noise. And at least a portion of the audience remains notably and pointedly silent. Men of Chestnut Hill United, make some noise. Oh, so how did that, how did that feel to the rest of you? <laughs> These men did not sound nearly excited enough, did they? <laughs> uh, okay, so Paul, Paul chose a gender-specific address. Men of Athens, welcome. 
that is actually what makes the ending of this story all the more remarkable. The story ends with some of the audience mocking Paul. Uh, some of them damning him with faint praise. Oh, yeah, that's really interesting, and we, we want to hear more about it some other time. <laughs> Come back later. But then it says, it says he left, and it says, some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysius the Areopagite, a dude. Uh, it's, that part is not in the story. We can just <laughs> know that. And a woman named Damaris and some others with them. So let's add a flower to our bouquet for Damaris, the patron saint of those who weren't counted but made themselves count. And maybe we can notice that from the very beginning, Christianity, the impulse of Christianity, has been towards expansiveness and inclusion. This is, after all, a key part of the stories that Jesus told in the way that he interacted with socially vulnerable people. The impulse of Christianity has always been towards expansiveness and inclusion, but the execution has not always been flawless, to say the least. Like how the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, written by the same person, Make a point of highlighting women who responded to Jesus and supported Jesus and the Jesus movement materially and financially with their own resources. And yet, then Paul walks into the Areopagus and acts like it's only the men who matter. How are we feeling tonight, men of Athens? Or like how Paul's a knucklehead in some of his letters and says women should keep their head covered and know their place and be silent in church and don't ask questions in church or hold positions of authority, but in other places, he assumes they're doing exactly that, holding positions of authority and leading prayers, and he writes about them as his co-laborers, which means that Paul is a lot like the rest of us who have any type of privilege, which means prone to blind spots, sometimes obtuse and oblivious to them, and at other times, capable of having the scales fall from his eyes. We are all products of our particular cultures, our family culture, our community culture, our religious culture, the wider culture that we all share in. They all shape us in ways that we are not consciously aware of until we're made consciously aware of them. Powerful people and powerful institutions do even more damage when they double down by refusing to acknowledge their blind spots and to see the things that they don't want to see. Like how more than 2,800 congregations have left the United Methodist Church since 2019 because they want to keep refusing to see and celebrate the sacred worth of queer folk in the fullness of their being. I guess it can be too difficult sometimes to admit when you're wrong. So let's be clear in this story and our story, our wider stories. It's not fair that people who are impacted by other folks' blind spots have to point them out. It's not fair that Damaris had to step through the men of Athens to claim her spot. It's not fair that anyone has to assert their sacred worth instead of having it taken for granted as the starting point. And yet, Damaris, in that context where she was made invisible by Paul's address, Damaris felt her heart strangely warmed by a spirit that she knew to be bigger and more all-encompassing than Paul's narrow words. And even though she wasn't invited, and even though she wasn't expected to, and even though she wasn't noticed and valued, she stepped forward. She asserted herself. She claimed her worth. And in this story, she is God's good news. Amen. <laughs>